Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Welcome, welcome to Oasis Community Church. At this time, we're going to transition from our time of worship to getting into the Word of God. And so, um, in a moment, our ushers will make their way up here. And if you need a Bible, or if you'd like to hear the sermon in Spanish, they'll be able to give you a device through which you can hear the sermon to be translated in Spanish, or they can give you a Bible, and you can follow along with the Scripture this morning. When you receive your Bible, or if you have your Bible, we're going to be continuing in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be finishing chapter 2 that Pastor Bob started last week. Buenos días y bienvenido a la casa de Dios. En este tiempo vamos a entrar al tiempo del mensaje. Si usted desea escuchar el mensaje en español, lo sugiere que están pasando por los pasillos. Tienen una maquinaria por lo cual puede oír el mensaje en español, o si usted necesita una Biblia, también ellos tienen eso uh, disponible para usted. Y tenemos, está, vamos a estar en el segundo capítulo del libro de Efesios en esta mañana, empezando con el versículo número 11. We'll be going through verse 11 to uh, 22 this morning. If you're a first-time guest here this morning, we want to welcome you. A special welcome to you. Uh, my name is David. I'm not the pastor. I'm one of the elders here. Pastor Bob, as you heard, he's away today, so we'll keep him in prayer. And, and all the others that we have been mentioning this morning, the families that are in need of prayer this morning. But... Um, God's will be done. We're here to give him honor and to give him glory. And his will is perfect. Even when it hurts and it doesn't feel right, his will is perfect. And so we trust that God is, is working his will out in these individuals and that uh, he's going to receive the honor and glory for uh, his name. Amen. So we want to welcome you here today. And as uh, Mark said, there's several things that are happening immediately after the service today. We have a uh, potluck. We're having a, a meal just to celebrate 28 years that God has been using Oasis here in this community. From God bringing our founding pastors from back east to starting off in a living room and in several moves to the facilities that we have today, all for the honor and glory of God and for his name to be proclaimed and the good news to be preached, not only here but wherever else because God has been using people from here to go to other parts of the world to proclaim the good news. So that is happening after service today. We'd like for you to be, stick around for that if you can. And also, like Mark said, we're going to continue the celebration this evening at 6 p.m., in your bulletins, there's that little announcement. So um, the CBU, uh, Cal Baptist University, men's choir, we're trying to figure out how to say that. Folks are going to be singing, all right? So it's a whole bunch of guys. I spoke to the director. His name is uh, Travion Williams this week, and uh, he's excited and thankful to Oasis Community Church for the invite to come here uh, this afternoon, this evening. He said that there is about 70, 75 individuals that are going to be in this group that are just going to be um, worshiping the name of the Lord. Amen. And he asked, you know, because he's got to figure things out, and he says, you know, what kind of church? Because some churches are very reserved, and some are very open, very laid back. He says, you know, we like to worship, and we like to engage the congregation in worship. So what kind of worshiping do you guys do? And I said, you ain't going to have any problem with us singing along. <laughs> We're a church that loves to worship. You might have a problem getting us to be quiet, but you won't have a problem with us singing, right? But uh, I invite you again this evening and invite some family, friends. There's those little invitations. You want to pass them out throughout the day. It's open to everybody, and it's going to be a great time. So we're excited about that happening this evening. Amen? Amen. So as Pastor Bob said uh, last week, uh, we started in the book of Ephesians, or a couple weeks ago. If you're able, would you please stand as we read the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And the Word of God says, Therefore... Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body reconciling both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. 
He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And verse 19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this time. We thank you for your presence, your Holy Spirit here with us today. And now, Lord, as we still our hearts and open our ears to hear the word that you have for us, we pray that you would penetrate our hearts. You know, Lord, each and every one of us. You know where we are at in our walk or in our faith or in our lack of faith. You know the needs of each one. And so I pray, Lord, today as we speak upon your word, that your spirit would minister to each and every one of us and that you would draw us closer to you and that you would draw us closer by the love of Christ and that we would be changed and be a little more Christ-like today. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So if you were here when Pastor Bob started this discussion about the book of Ephesians, um, you know what it's about. We're going to just kind of do a little quick review just to bring some folks up to speed in case you weren't here and kind of set the stage. But the book of Ephesians was a letter that Paul had written to this young church. Paul was originally, his name was Saul. And he was a Jew and had been raised in all the Jewish customs and all the Jewish traditions. And he knew the law like nobody's business. And he could argue it, and he was just rock solid when it came to the old traditions and the Jewish ways of living in the Jewish law. And he was being trained and being groomed and being prepared to be one of the religious leaders of the law. So he knew all there was to know about what it meant to be Jewish and what it meant to be a Jew and about all of that. And when Christ came, Christ came, lived among us, lived a life, and then he gave his life as a sacrifice so that we would have forgiveness of our sins. And he fulfilled all that the law was talking about. In fact, the law and all the sacrifices and the prophets, everything that they spoke about was foreshadowing. We were pointing forward to what Christ was going to come and fulfill. And after Christ had left, many had converted from Judaism to Christianity, and then those who didn't even know about the religions or know about God became Christians. And it was called the way. And so Saul, he had been so entrenched in that, he saw this as an obstacle, and he saw this as bringing down the true religion and bringing down the law. And so his mission now was to eradicate all those who were following the way. And Saul was going out, he had letters that gave him authority to be able to imprison people or to beat them, or even if he had to murder them, to have them repent from wanting to follow the way and come back to, Jew to being a Jewish, or be, uh, to Judaism. That was his mission. But we know in the book of Acts, if you read, he, he is on his way to Damascus and he meets Christ. He has this encounter and he realizes that he was on the wrong track. And that the law and all that he had studied was really pointing to Christ. And so he converts to, to Christianity. He goes away. He, his God works in him, changes his attitude, changes his mind, changes everything that he knew about what it was and now fully understands it. And God selects him to take the good news to the Gentiles. And so now Paul, his name was changed from Saul to Paul because Saul, he had a bad reputation. He was one bad dude and they didn't, you know, that would brought some fear. So now he is Paul and now he's going, he's doing these missionary trips throughout the known world. And at this time, this was the second missionary trip that he goes to Ephesus, establishes a church, and he is now probably three or five years after the fact writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is uh, today's modern-day Turkey. So he's writing this letter, and he's giving them some instructions to these young Christians. And in the first half of this chapter, he talks about how we are saved through grace. He talks about how we are guilty in our sin, that we live in a sinful nature, and that apart from Christ, we're dead in our sin. Now you may say, wait a minute, I, I'm sorry David, I'm alive, I'm right here, I'm breathing, I'm seeing you, I'm here. I see what's going on, I'm not dead. Spiritually speaking, if you do not know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are dead in your sin. 
We all were. Everyone who did not accept or hasn't accepted Christ as Lord and Savior is spiritually dead. And like we talked about last week, you, your spiritual state, your eternity is going to depend on if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or not. There is no in-between. There is no halfway house. You are either going to spend eternity with Christ in heaven or you're going to spend eternity away or apart from Christ and in hell. Not my rules. It's what the Bible says. That's what God says. Today we talked about some folks who are at the door of eternity. And it's refreshing to know that each one of those individuals, heaven's gates are open wide waiting to receive those. They have made their decision. They accepted Jesus Christ. And they know where their hope and their eternity lies. But for those who haven't, it's a different story. And so Paul, in this first part of the letter, he was talking about that. And then he started to transition into the second part of the letter. And you know what Paul does here is very, very cunning, very, very neat the way he starts the second part of this letter. It's a tactic that's used today in our world. What he's doing is he's talking to one group of people, but he's also sending a message to the other group. If we'll look at that in a minute, but he's, he's talking to one and sending a message to another. That happens in our world today. In business, in social settings, in politics, wherever that happens, where someone is being addressed, but at the same time, somebody who needs to hear it is within earshot. Not too long ago, it happened in the sports world. We like sports here. If you're a visitor, yeah, we like sports here. So not too long ago, there was this athlete in the NBA, well-known LeBron James, one of the most talented players of the sport in history. And there was an interviewer who was asking questions, and LeBron started talking about another player who's very talented, up and coming. And what LeBron says, you know, I, I dream about playing with him. I fantasize about playing games with him. I, I think about the games we could win and the titles we could, the championships and all that could happen if, if we were to play. Well, when he said that, all the owners of all the teams, it was a big uproar. They got all upset because they said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. He can't do that. He can't do that. What he's doing, he's lobbying for that player to come. Although he didn't say, the, the player's name is Anthony Davis. He didn't say, hey, Anthony, I'd like for you to come to the Lakers and play here so we can win some championships. He didn't flat out say that. But he's saying, you know, I dream about that. That'd be great. And all the owners got very upset. They started calling for investigations. They started calling for sanctions against the Lakers. They said, hey, you know, he should be fine because he's, he's breaking our rules. He's doing things that by our bylaws should not happen. That's what Paul does. Paul's talking to the Gentiles. He's addressing them, but he's also letting, letting the Jews know something. Paul knew that this letter that was being sent to the church in Ephesus would be rewritten, would be read, would be passed out, and that it was going to go around, and him being a Jew, God selected him to go to the Gentiles, was still sending messages to get their attention. Let's look at that. Starting again in verse 11, it says, Therefore, therefore that you're saved by grace, you're saved through what Christ did, because you couldn't do it on your own. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by hands of men. Remember that at one time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. He's talking to the Gentiles again. And he says, you know, you who are being called uncircumcised by those who are circumcised. We won't get into that, but basically what he's just saying that you who weren't marked like them, you're being called unworthy. You are called dirty. You are called worthless. You are called undeserving. You are called less than by those who feel they have this right. You're called that because you were not born into that Heritage. You weren't born in Israel. You weren't born as a Jew. You're being separated because they feel they have something that you don't. Right? And that circumcision was a contract, was an agreement, was a covenant that God made with a man named Abraham. God's will was going to be worked out and he picked Abraham and he told Abraham, you know Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations. Now Abraham, you've no story about Abraham and Sarah, they're well beyond their childbearing years. But there's nothing impossible for God. 
And God says, Abraham, from you, you're going to be blessed. Your children will be blessed. Your children's children will be blessed. From generation to generation, you are going to be blessed. You will have land. You will have wealth. From you, there will be rulers and kings. And from you, there will be one who's going to rule Israel. And from you, there will be one who is going to be the king of all kings. It's my covenant with you that God was making with Abraham. And a covenant is like a contract. And there's two types of contracts. There's a conditional contract and an unconditional contract. So if you have a conditional contract, that's where two parties say, we're gonna, we want a certain objective to happen or a certain result, and we're going to agree to do certain things. And you're going to do this, I'm going to do this, and this is what's going to come out. But if you don't do this, and I don't do this, if either party fails their part, the result is not going to happen, and the contract is null and void. Now there's an unconditional contract. That one party says, I am going to do this, and this is going to be the result. Doesn't matter what the other person does. It's all dependent on that one person. And what God did with Abraham is he made a covenant that was unconditional. It wasn't because Abraham was special, he was good looking, or he had a lot of things, or that he somehow had some special powers. God chose Abraham for his will to be done. And God says to Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your children and your children's children for generations and kings and rulers and all these things are going to happen because of my covenant with you. Not because Abraham had anything to do. He couldn't do anything. It was all dependent on what God was going to do. And God is faithful. And we find this in the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. And I'll read it for you. Starting in verse 9. From verse 1 to 8, God is saying what he's going to do. And then in verse 9, it says, Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant that you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. This is my covenant with you is what God says. This is what I'm going to do with you. This is my agreement with you. It was all dependent on God and not on Abraham. That's the way our salvation works. There was nothing that we could have done or nothing that we can do, no amount of money we can give, no amount of acts that we could do to, to make amends for sin in our life to earn salvation. It's all on what God did for us. It's on the grace of God, the gift of salvation, what Christ did on the cross that allows us to be saved from our sin and from the punishment that's coming, the condemnation. That's what God was telling Abraham. It's all on me. But you will go through circumcision. What that meant was to be marked. To have a physical mark that would identify that person as different than others. And for us, it's being forgiven of our sins and having Christ in our life and the Holy Spirit residing in us that separates us from other. That's what it's about. So this, Paul starts talking about this and he says, hey, this group that, that has that mark is looking at this group that doesn't and they call you these things. And then he brings them back and starts reminding them in verse 12. He says, Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. He lays out five conditions that they have. He says, first of all, you don't have Christ. And Christ is a, a Messiah, it's a Savior. You were without a Savior. He says you were without being a citizen of Israel, meaning you don't have any rights. You don't have any, any heritage. You don't have anything there because you, weren't, you didn't have a, 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 a savior. You weren't a citizen. He says you're a foreigner. means you're wandering, you're lost, you don't have a home, you don't belong. He says you don't have hope. Well, if you don't have those other three, you're not going to have hope because there's no one there to help you, no one to guide you, no one to be there for you. So they had no hope. And then he caps it off and says, and you were without God in this world. That's the condition they were in before grace. That's a condition we are all in before we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so Paul is laying this out for them and he's telling them, this is what you were in and you are being called that by those who think they have it already on you. Then in verse 15, he says, but now, that's the way you were before, 
Things have changed because Christ. He says, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility. He says, that's the way you were, but now because of the blood of Christ, because Christ came and sacrificed his life, and we now have that ability to be made one with God through Jesus Christ, you're brought near. You were far off, but now you are brought near. You see, back in the old days, way old days, in ancient times, when someone sinned, when someone did wrong, there was a sacrifice that had to happen. There was an animal that would be sacrificed, meaning that for that sin, there had to be loss of life and there had to be the shedding of blood. But those sacrifices only covered the sins of people. It only appeased their errors. It only, for temporary time, would just suffice. When Christ came, when he gave his life, he didn't cover our sins. He forgave our sins. And they were done away with. And we were made right with God as if we had not sinned before. And through the blood of Christ, we are now brought back into that relationship with God the Father. Amen? <laughs> then, then he starts talking about this. And, and he says, because of that, we have peace. When Christ walked on earth and he was preaching the good news, as he's getting ready to go and give his life for that sacrifice, getting ready to go to the cross, he's giving his disciples instructions and he's talking to them and telling them and preparing them for things that are going to happen. And in the book of John, in chapter 14, verse 27, he says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Christ is saying, I'm giving you peace, but not like the world gives you. You see, the peace that the world gives is temporal. The peace that we look for, that we want to have, doesn't satisfy. It doesn't last. We want to go away for the weekend to get away from it all. We want to save up money to go on a vacation. We'll go on a cruise. We'll go to the mountains. We get away from the 91 and 60 freeway. We get away from the kids arguing and fighting. We get away from the stuff that's happening at work. We get away from all the congestions. And when we're there, oh, this is good, right? We like this. And we say, man, why can't life be like this all the time, right? We enjoy it. It's a good for you to relax, to get you to let your hair down for those who have hair, right? <laughs> you just have a good time. But what happens when you come back? The 91 is still congested. The 60 people are flipping you off. The kids are still rambunctious. Work doubled while you were away and the problems are waiting for you. And that temporal peace, you're like, oh, I wish I was still there. But now you're back to reality. You know what Christ says? The peace I give you surpasses all understanding. What Christ was saying is, I am peace. I am giving you me. I am going to be with you when the kids are rambunctious, when the work isn't going right, when people are cutting you off, when life is tough. I am going to be there with you because I am your peace. Not like the world gives it. Paul is saying that he's, when it, through his blood, through him, he's given us peace. And he talks about this hostility. This wall of hostility, this divide that's going on. Now, some theologians said, well, the wall was the wall that was around the temple. In ancient times in Jerusalem, the temple was built, and then there was this wall that was built around it. Part of it is still there, the wailing wall. So people thought that that's what he was talking about, that that wall would be knocked down. Because it gave that impression that not everyone can come to the temple. Only certain people at certain times could walk into that, and you had to be a certain class to be able to get into. So some thought it was that wall. Others thought it was in the actual temple. See, in the actual temple, the, the priests would go in, but they could only go so far. And then there was this curtain that divided the holy place from what's called the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. And there was this curtain, a very thick curtain, that divided those two. And only once a year, the high priest could enter in and offer a sacrifice for the people and then leave. But when Christ was crucified on the cross, the Bible says that from top to bottom, that was torn. Meaning that there's no longer a divide between man and God himself because of what Christ did. Amen. Right? But what Paul's talking about here is the hostility, the hostility between the two groups. There was this friction. 
Because one group over here who had been circumcised and were in that and had been there for a while thought that, well, we've earned it. It's ours. And then the other group who said, well, that's kind of ours, but they're kind of arrogant. They kind of treat us different. They look down at us. And Paul was saying, it's not about what they have, have or what you think you don't have. It's about Jesus being our peace and being our peacemaker and reconciling us to God. It's about Jesus coming and dividing that, changing those attitudes, changing those thoughts. Because sometimes, you know, as Christians, we kind of get comfortable in our salvation. Sometimes as Christians, we think that we're a little bit better than others. Sometimes as Christians, we want to be very selective about who we associate with because, well, maybe they don't dress right or they don't talk right. Or maybe they don't even smell right. We don't want to get involved with people that need to hear the good news. And it creates this divide. And so others will look and say, well, why do I want to be like that? Why do I want to have that arrogance about me? That, that's, that doesn't make me feel loved. It doesn't make me feel welcome. It doesn't, that's not for me. Christ came once and for all for all mankind. Doesn't matter education status or financial status. Doesn't matter who you know or what you've done or where you've been. We are all sinners before we come to know the love of Christ. And that's what Jesus came to do. To give his life on the cross so that all mankind could make a way back to the Father. And so that is what Paul was talking about. He's talking about the sacrifice that Christ did so that we could be made right with God. So that we could be justified with God. And being justified means that just as if you had never sinned. That's what the sacrifice of Christ was about. Giving his life for ours. Shedding his blood not to cover our sin, but to wash away our sins. To make us right with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 11 says, since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We've been justified by the blood of Christ, his sacrifice. For if, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Now, this is so, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Being reconciled with God. Now you may say, wait a minute. It says there about being enemies of God. I didn't choose to be an enemy of God. I never was opposite of God. I never wanted to fight against God. But like Pastor Bob said last week, either you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you don't. And you follow after the ways of sin, and after the ways of this world, and after the ways of Satan. So you're saying, well, I, I'm not choosing to follow Satan. But if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, by default, that's where you are. Let me give you an example. Next Sunday is going to be a football game, if you haven't heard. (laughs) Right? And there's going to be two teams playing against each other. There's going to be the Los Angeles Rams, and there's going to be the New England Patriots. So everybody who likes sports and likes football has a vested interest in that game because we enjoy the sport. But everybody's not a Rams fan and everybody's not a Patriot fan. But on that day, everybody's going to be one or the other, right? Because some people are going to say, you know what? I am sick and tired of Tom Brady and the Patriots being in the championship game. I don't want those guys to win, so I'm going to be rooting for the Rams. I want the Rams to win, right? Right? But then there's the other group that says, you know what? The Rams shouldn't be there. They cheated, right? The referees allowed them to get in there. So I think that was pretty bad. And so I don't think they deserve to be there, so they shouldn't win, so I'm going to root for the Patriots, right? That's what we do. If we do not accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we are on the other side of that, and we are enemies of God. That's what it's about. That's what Paul is saying here, right? That's what Romans tells us. But because of the love of Christ... Because of the grace of God, because he came and he gave his life for us, he shed his blood, we now can be reconciled to the Father. Think of a time when someone maybe has done you wrong, or maybe you have said something and done something wrong to somebody, right? And after you mull that over and think about that, and that you go to that person, that person comes to you and says, hey, you know what? 
I, I'm sorry. I, I blew that. I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I didn't mean to hurt you. I, I didn't mean to, to cause you pain. And, and would you forgive me? Would you forgive me for what I did? What happens? Right? Your guard drops and you're just like, yeah, I, I'll forgive you. And, and let's start over. Let's, let's start fresh and, and let's rebuild again. That's what it is, right? We are sin, sinful by nature. And God has sent his son to make a way for us to be reconciled to the Father. And it's simply just saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for what I've done. I have lived contrary to your will. I have lived in opposition to you. I recognize that's wrong and I'm sorry. Please come be the Lord of my life. And God the Father wraps his arms around you and he says, welcome home, my son. Welcome home, my daughter. And now we are reconciled to God the Father through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 17 and 18. Paul continues talking to them. And this is how it happens. Excuse me, verse... Yep. 16 and 17 says, And in this one body reconciled to him through God, through, reconciled to God through the cross, by which he put death their hostility. 17 says, And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Christ came and he preached the good news. He preached about the kingdom of God. He came and he fulfilled every requirement, every regulation, every nook and cranny, if you want, of the law. And then he gave his life because he was the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to forgive all mankind of their sins. And in doing so, he was letting the Jews know, look, that law, the prophets, all those things were foreshadowing, talking about me. And he was letting the Gentiles know, look, all that stuff was about me, bringing them together. I have fulfilled that, and I've given my life so that you have a way to the Father. And Jesus was preaching near and far. Now, he wasn't in his deity where he can go all over the place. He was in a physical form. But he was going throughout the region preaching to those who would listen, those who would hear, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 4, 23 says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven, and healing every disease and sickness among the poor. He was fulfilling the will of God the Father. Letting them know what all that meant, what the Ten Commandments were, what the prophets did, what the sacrifices were, everything that the law meant, he was explaining to them out in the public and in the synagogues, in the places where it was being taught, in the places where it was being disseminated so people would understand. He was making sure they understood that's what it was about. Then Paul starts to wrap up the chapter with verse 19. And he says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens of God and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God's, God's spirit lives. Paul starts to wrap this up. Talked about grace, the condition of man before grace. That the blood of Christ was shed so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we can be reconciled once again with God. And then he reminds them of those five conditions that he talked about in verse 12. Because he says, you're no longer without Christ. Now you have a Savior. You have salvation because Jesus has come to be our Savior. You're no longer an outsider because now you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now you belong. You're no longer a foreigner because you've accepted the gift of salvation. So you have a home. You belong. You are a son or daughter of the living God. He says you are no longer without hope because our hope is in Jesus. We do have a hope and expectation. God has a plan and a purpose. He's got it under control. So you're no longer out there without hope. And he says you are no longer without a God because God the Father has received you and you have been reconciled to him through Christ Jesus. Paul is talking to both groups here. But you know what? This letter is also talking to us today. 
Because there are people who still need to know the good news. There are people that still need to know that there is a God who loves them. There are people that still need to know what this Jesus story is all about. It's about eternity. It's about spending time in heaven or in hell. It's about being forgiven of your sins because you are not capable. I am not capable. We are not able to pay enough, to work enough, to earn somehow, some way, the right to be reconciled to the Father and make ourselves good. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Romans tells us that. Think about that. The wages of sin is death. For those of us who are working, and if you're retired, remember when you worked. All week long you worked. Whatever kind of job, if it's a manual job, or if it's an administrative job, or if it's management, all week long you worked, and at the end of the week you get your paycheck. And you look at your paycheck, and that little box that has your salary, it says death. You're going to say, wait, I got to go to HR. <laughs> I got to go and talk to somebody in payroll. There's a mistake on my check, and a big one by, from what I see. Now, we look at the amount of taxes we pay, and we think that that's death already, but that's a different story, <laughs> right? That's a whole different story. But it says death, and, and, and so you want to go to payroll and say, well, wait a minute. I've been here every day. I come on time. I'm a good person. This is probably for Sally because she criticizes people, right? <laughs> or maybe this is for Billy because he uses bad language and, and he doesn't act right. And they gossip and they look down on people and, and they, they, they call, but not me, I'm a good person. I do right. I follow the rules. The wages of sin is death. It requires a sacrifice. And that sacrifice has been paid on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You look in your bulletin, it's got that picture of the cross and that gap. Can you put that up, Nathan? Right? And Jesus came to bridge the gap between sinner and a holy God. He came to make a way so that we can be reconciled to the Father. Because we could not cross that by ourselves. There was no way of doing that. But by the grace of God, sending his only begotten Son to give his life for yours, to take your guilt, my guilt, our shame, our failures, to take all of that upon himself and to clothe us with his righteousness so that we can be reconciled to the Father. That's the story of Jesus. That he loves this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and he came and lived the perfect life. Tempted and tried in every way. Fulfilled every facet of the law. So that at the time of his choosing, he can lay down his life for you and for me. And for all who would come and receive him as Lord and Savior. In closing, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4 and 6 says this. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await that through the spirit of righteousness, which is our hope, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or non-circumcision have any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressed through love. Faith that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Faith that he loves us so much that he gave his life for ours. This letter was written for the Christians and for the Jews and for the uh, Gentiles of the time. But it's also for us today. Yes. God is speaking to us and saying, because you have been attending church for a long time, check yourself. Where's your heart at? Where's your attitude? Where are your motives? Why are you coming to church to be seen? Why are you involved in things because you want to earn some kudos or earn some brownie points? It has nothing to do with what you and I can do. It has all to do with what Christ did on the cross for us. He's also talking to those who don't know Jesus. Maybe you've heard the story and you're not sure. 
Maybe you've heard people talk about Jesus. He's talking to you and saying, I love you so much that I gave my life for you. You don't have to carry that burden. You don't have to go through those things by yourself because I am there with you if you accept me. I will forgive you of all your sins and restore you and have you reconcile with the Father again. That is God's will for us to be in a relationship with him. And today we have that opportunity. Today God is speaking to both. God is speaking to all of us. Because maybe some of us who have been following after Christ have drifted off a bit. Maybe some of us have become critical of others and feel that maybe we are the gatekeepers of who should or should not serve. Maybe some of us have some judgmental values that we're trying to apply when we have no right to do that. That's for God to do. On the other hand, there's some of us who have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And today is the day of salvation. This morning we prayed for people who were in our hearts and our minds, for those who are at, at the door of eternity. And thank God that the doors of heaven are wide open for Brother Daryl and for the others who have accepted him. And it's going to be a celebration. Yes, we go through a grieving process, but that is our hope, is to be with Christ forevermore. If you have Jesus Christ, like Daryl does, if you have Jesus Christ, when you close your eyes here, you're going to open your eyes and be face to face with your Creator forever and ever and evermore. But if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not made that decision, today is the day. Because that decision has to happen on this side of eternity, not after. There is no, hey, last chance. Do you want to make it? Do you want to make a deal? No. God's already taken care of that. And it's a free gift of salvation. And today, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to make that decision, we're going to have folks up here, we're going to pray with you, and, and we'd love to have that prayer with you and to be able to celebrate that with you. Or maybe, maybe there's a time for you to reconcile with God because you've drifted away, or maybe you are in a path that isn't quite right, and God is speaking to you. He wants you to get right. He's asking for repentance because tomorrow is not promised to us. Yesterday, we can't go back. We're standing here today, but tomorrow, we don't know. That's in God's hands. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time for you to secure your eternity with Christ Jesus, not because of what you can do or you can offer, but because of what he did on the cross for us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that, Lord, you love us so much that you sent Jesus, your only begotten Son, to give us a way to be reconciled to you. Sin has come in and has destroyed our lives and has separated us from you. But thank you, Lord, that sin has been dealt with. That when your Son gave his life on the cross, that when his body was beaten and bruised, that when he received those punches and pulling his hair and pulling his beard and, and the thorn that was put on his, his crown and, and the stripes upon his back and all the punishment that he took, the Bible says that, that he looked so disfigured it didn't even look like a man. He took all that upon himself for each and every person throughout the world so that we would not have to go through that because we could not make a way back to you. He was the perfect sacrifice and he gave his life for us. And then they laid his body in a tomb thinking that it was over, not realizing that that was your plan and your purpose. And then on the third day, by his spirit, by his power, he rose, he rose himself up and he defeated death, he defeated sin, he defeated sickness, he defeated Satan, he defeated this world and gave us the victory. And today, we can come before the cross, come before the, the feet of our Savior and say, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me for my thoughts. Forgive me for my actions that are contrary to you. Wash away my sins. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. 
and we can be restored and reconciled to God the Father once again and be just as if we had never sinned before. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing truth to us, for opening our eyes and our ears. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of salvation and for making a way to the Father. This time, I just, with our eyes closed, heads bowed. First, I want to talk to those of us who have accepted Jesus, and maybe, maybe we find ourselves wavering in our faith, and maybe we find that we have said things or thought things or acted out in ways that are not the way God would want us to be. Maybe you're struggling with some things right now that, that the Holy Spirit is just ministering in your heart. And you know that those things are wrong and, and, and you think that people don't know. There's nothing that you can't hide from God. He sees that and he's saying, come. I want to fix that. I want to restore that. I want that relationship to be where it should be between me and you. Today is the day to reconcile with God the Father. Maybe there's someone here today who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That they've been struggling with things in their lives and that they've been hearing about salvation, but, but they just can't wrap their mind around it and think that they are worthy or deserving of salvation. But Jesus paid the price already. He gave his life for you so that you don't have to have that struggle. You can just come and say, forgive me of my sins. Restore me to the Father. I want to start a new life in you. I want to go in a different direction. I want you to guide me and help me. And he will give you his peace. The Bible says that the peace of God surpasses all understanding. We're going to go through struggles. We're going to go through difficulties. We're going to go through challenges in this life. But he says, don't worry. Don't be afraid. I have overcome this world. God has a plan and a purpose for you. So today, if you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right where you're at your seat, just say, Father God, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my lifestyle that's contrary to you. I know that you love me now. I understand that you have a plan and a purpose, and, and I want to do your will. I want you to be in my life. I want to turn from my old habits and my old ways and the, and the things I did before and I want to go in a different direction I want you to lead me I want to make you Lord of my life Lord Jesus come into my heart forgive me my sins and I accept you as my Lord and Savior if you've said that prayer this morning if you believe that the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth you shall be saved if you said that prayer this morning, please come up to one of us. There's going to have some folks up here that will be ready to pray with you. And, and to my left, to your right, there's going to be some people that will have some information. We want to pray with you and, and get you on the right track and be able to help you in this new life. Our worship team is going to lead us in a time of worship. And we're going to sing some songs. And, and this will be a time for us to come and pray. If you want to come up to these steps right here and pray, or if you would like to pray in your seat where you're at, be a time of meditation, a time of reconciliation, a time of giving your life to Christ, a time of, of just giving God thanks if things are well and you're just so glad of how God is working in your life. That's offered for you as well. Maybe you'd like to just sit in your seat and that's okay. However you like to pray to God or however you want to worship, this is God's house. The important thing is that you speak to God because he's been speaking to you. He's been pursuing you all your life. He's been after you and he's not going to stop because he loves you and because he wants to save you from the judgment that is coming. People say, how can God send us to hell if he's a good God? God doesn't send us to hell. He's making a way for us to avoid that. Sin takes us to hell. Unrepented sin takes us there. Not God. God gave his son so that we can be reconciled to God the Father through him. At this time, if you're able, would you please stand as our worship team leads us in prayer. Our prayer partners, if you can come up and take your positions.